Good morning and welcome to Church and Study. This quarter's adult Sabbath school lesson is titled God's Mission, My Mission. It's designed to focus attention on getting out there and doing something. We will examine many wonderful Bible stories. We will read about exciting experiences and illustrations. The real focus and the real heart of each lesson is a challenge to get out and actually do something. In the end, it's our desire that this quarter be remembered not for memorable thoughts, engaging stories, or deep theological concepts, but it is our desire that we will look back on this quarter and at the time when the Holy Spirit took our humble efforts and worked mission miracles for the honor and glory of his name. Our teachers have studied and prepared to discuss this week's lesson. Please feel free to comment and ask questions in the chat. Good morning, Sabbath School, and thank you for joining us again as we study the Word of God in this quarter's lesson of uh, God's Mission, My Mission. Uh, today we have part one of the topic of Mission to the Unreached. Shall we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us, our loving Father in heaven, as we come before you, we are thankful that you have given us the opportunity to understand how and what methods we might be able to employ as we try to share the good news of salvation to those who have never heard it, have no familiarity with it. May we be able to listen and learn how Paul went about doing this work in the city of Athens. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen and good morning. Uh, happy Sabbath. Our topic this week, the unreached. Um, our overview, uh, we have on our slide, uh, the overview, we are talking about Paul is teaching in a different way. <laughs> if Paul were teaching to the Jews, when he would go to the synagogue, he would be talking about Jesus. And that, and that they should be accepting Jesus. But today we are in a different situation. And he has to now preach in a different way. He is in the synagogue. He will be presenting a message of salvation to those who already know Jesus. And that is an easier thing to do than what he is um, going to do when he gets to Athens. Um, and so reaching out to those who, who know nothing about Jesus is somewhat and is a lot, lot different. So we are learning um, this week what Paul has done and what we should do when we are going to talk to someone who have never heard or have been introduced to Jesus. So we are, we are suggesting we, do, we need a new way of thinking. <laughs> we need a new way of preaching. preaching. Yes. Yes. Good to start with common ground. If you have a non-Sabbath people, Sounds you might want to say that, oh, I know that you um, worship God and God is hearing your worship on a Friday or on a Sunday. And then um, your speech night to, needs to be adopted because what you might want to do is to talk about some of the persons who write 
about what that person is worshiping. And at the end of the day, um, Dr. Jackson, Sister Jackson, we present Christ. Amen. Yes. We present Christ Amen. at the end of the day. So, Sister Jackson, our memory text says, and God, who made the world and everything in it, it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. Isn't that a wonderful assurance? Yes. That we can look up to the God who is the Lord of heaven, and we can preach that everywhere. Amen. Paul goes to Athens. <laughs> Okay, okay, now we begin Sunday's lesson in Acts 17, and, and there's a, a question asked, how did Paul wind up in Athens, and how did he respond to what he found there, and so that's what we're going to talk about. How did he wind up in Athens first? Paul was in Thessalonica, and as his custom was, when he went into a city, he went to the synagogue and preached, and that's what he was doing there. And Paul preached about Jesus in Acts 1 through 16. Luke tells us, that Paul preached about Jesus crucified and risen again. And it's interesting that Luke tells us how he did it. As um, Brother Carrington said, we might look at the methods to be used. Luke says in Acts that Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures, that means he dialogued with them. There was an exchange of questions and answers from the scriptures. Mm -hmm. He also says that he explained. This means Paul opened the scriptures with clarity and simplicity. And then he gave evidence from the scriptures persuasive evidence. In other words, Paul did a three-week evangelistic <laughs> campaign in Thessalonica. And as a result, some of them were persuaded. And they accepted what Paul was saying, but um, there were some Jews who were not persuaded and they caused a lot of trouble. And uh, Acts said they took evil men from the marketplace and formed them into a mob. And that mob went after Paul and his workers. Um, and you know, they were so determined that when they couldn't find Paul, they got Jason. <laughs> Uh, who had been housing Paul and Silas while they were there. The mob accused them of turning the world upside down and accused them of going against Caesar, the Roman government. But I looked at this, turning the world upside down, um, and I thought it would be a blessing if people could say that about us today, mm. if we could be so effective today that <clears throat> we could turn the world upside down for people. In other words, they were accusing them of impacting their world Amen. to the point that nothing seemed the same anymore. Amen. But anyway, Things got so bad 
that the brethren sent Paul and Silas away by night and sent them to Berea. When they went to Berea, they did the same thing. Paul did the same thing he usually does. <laughs> he went into the synagogue and he preached. Um, but the Bereans were not like the people in Thessalonica. They, they were more fair-minded. Um, and how do we know that? because the Bible tells us that they receive the word with all readiness and that they search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They received the word when Paul preached, they listened and they opened their hearts to God, their heads and their hearts to God. And they searched the scriptures. Um, they investigated what Paul was saying to find out if that was really what was in God's word. And they wanted to know the truth. Um, therefore, while Paul was in Berea, many of the people there believed but trouble follows you <laughs> when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was being preached by Paul in Berea what did they do they came and stirred up the crowds there um, they were not satisfied to force Paul out of their own city but they even followed him to Berea to disrupt his work there also. And they disrupted it to the point that the Christians in Berea sent Paul away to Athens, fearing for his life and a total disruption of the work going on there. But both Silas and Timothy remained in Berea um, because Paul wanted to leave them behind to teach and take care of the new Christians. But that's how Paul got to Athens. Um, now, Athens, Athens, at the time that Paul visit, visited Athens, that city was no longer an important political seat. Um, Corinth was the commercial and political center of Greece under the Roman Caesars. But um, Athens was still what we would call today a university center, the mm. university center of the world. Mm. It was the the city of the great philosophers, the city of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle Ooh. and the other philosophers. Um, and even though it had lost its political importance, it was still a center of art, beauty, culture, and knowledge. And as the apostle walked around that city, he saw those great temples and theaters that they had dedicated to their gods. Um, that they had dedicated to their gods. And um, I, when I did some research, I found that one writer, no, more than one writer, tells us that at that time, you know, Paul said the 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 city was was, was filled with with gods. At that time, there were, can you believe this? The the Athenians had thirty 
thousand gods <laughs> that they worship. Yeah. Um, many of these statues have survived and and can you can find copies of them, the statues of the guards and things everywhere. But Paul recognized that these were not merely objects of art, but they were actual gods being worshipped by the people of Athens. Um, and one of the ancient writers tell us that it was easier to find a god in Athens than it was to find a man. And with 30,000 gods, <laughs> wow. um, no wonder you can see why someone would say that. Now, um, Luke tells us that Paul's spirit was moved when he saw this. He was provoked. He was emotionally concerned about the idolatry that was there. Um, and we believe that each idol revealed that these, these men and women of Athens had a great capacity for something other than themselves. Mm -hmm. They knew there was something beyond man and they were seeking for it. But each idol revealed that, that they had a twisted knowledge of what the true God was like. So when Paul saw what was happening in the city, he began to preach. He couldn't do anything else. Mm. He, couldn't, he, he couldn't help himself. He had to start preaching. And even though his helpers were not there, Silas and Timothy, he found that he needed to start delivering um, the message of Jesus right away. He, he, he worked with different groups of people. He went into the synagogue as his custom was, and he spoke to the Jews there. He went into the marketplace and he, and he preached to the common people. Um, and there was a third group, the philosophers. And as we go through this lesson this week, we will see what happened as he worked with these groups of people. Um, Monday's, uh, lesson, Monday's lesson, we continued with Paul's approach in this strange non-Jewish place. So Paul is yet in Athens, but in Athens, there is that location called the Areopagus, the place of uh, judicial functions and legislative functions and uh, even some executive powers. You know, with our three side of our government, they all existed right there. And so Paul was taken there. And let's see how he got there. If we go to Acts If we go to Acts chapter 17, verse 17 to 21, I'm reading from the from message quickly. It says that when Paul entered, just as Sister Jackson was saying, when, when he entered Athens, the city was a junk, a junk yard of idols. And he, Paul, discussed it. He raised the question with the Jews and other like-minded people at their meeting place. And every day he, he went out. So here's his strategy. So he started discussing and now he's going on. Every day he went out on the streets and talked with anyone who happened along. He got to know some of the um, Epicureans and the, Sto and the Stoics intellectuals pretty well through these conversations. So he's getting to know the people. 
Some of them dismissed him with sarcasm, of course. Um, what what an what an ear ear ahead, but others listening to him go on about Jesus and the resurrection were intrigued. That's a new slant on the gods. Because remember, in Athens, the people were concerned about philosophy, trying to understand life, trying to be able to explain life. And here they're getting a new teaching, um, something different to the gods that they knew, something different to the gods that they that they worship, those 30,000 of which Dr. Jackson spoke. These people got together and asked him, Paul, to make a public presentation over at the Aropagos, that place of uh, that 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 center of 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 the of the legal presence and judicial functions here in Athens. So he asked them to go there, where these other philosophers are, where things are a little quieter. They said, "This is a new one on us. We've never heard anything." quite like it. Where did you come up with this anyway? <laughs> Explain it so we can understand. Downtown Athens was a great place for gossip. There were always people hanging around, natives and tourists alike, waiting for the latest tidbit on, mo on most anything. So these people were interested in philosophy. Paul had a breakthrough. He was able to go down into the city, find a new approach. Now, when he's with the Jews, he's in the synagogue. When he came here in Athens, where the people were worshiping false gods, he went down on the streets and got to know them so that and um, so that they can. So he gets a fair opportunity, became their friend, as it were. Earlier, I heard that he became a friend to these people and they were more receptive to listen to him. So let's share a few thoughts in summary from our slide there. Um, Acts chapter 17 of verse 20, you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. So by now people are, the, the, the population is receptive to him, the philosophers, whatever degree of, of learning they're, they were at, trying to explore life, understand the meaning of life, they're now getting a new insight of, of life. And in fact, one of the biggest insights we have to always keep focus on is that every message, every motive we have is to keep it Christ-centered. Our message must be Christ-centered. And wherever we, wherever we start from, that's the place we must we must get to, and that's the place we must that's the place where salvation is found. So here, um, after, after some time preaching in the square, the, Athen the Athenians were surprised by the idea that Paul presented. Avid seekers of new teachings, the Athenians wanted to understand more. Of course, we just read that. What he said about God had nothing to do with the way the, 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 Cypri the Cyprius and the vain gods acted. That is, they, they, for them, their gods were always acting with, with sudden mood, change of moods and sudden change of behaviors. But the, the, the God that Paul was preaching was a God of, of steadiness. He is eternal. And he brought salvation. He, he made a difference. The, the, the God that Paul brought was a God who cared and made a difference in lives. Accustomed to debating philosophical thoughts, they saw the coherence of, of Paul's reasoning and the God of uh, Paul, Paul's God. Paul had become familiar with the Greek through culture, so he knew what he was talking about. He knew where the people were, and he was able to bring the gospel at the level they were at until they grew to understand more of King Jesus. So it was a simple matter. Paul is saying, we are learning here from Paul in taking the message to or the on the unreachable, those who are on yet unreached, as it were, sorry, mm -hmm. um, that we need to get where they are, um, understand their culture, and teach this Christ-centered gospel as they um, as they can understand it. Later on, Paul talks about true, being babes. You begin to eat, you begin to, 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 to be, eat the food of ba like babes, but then you must grow into maturity. And that's what Paul did as he was in Athens. Tuesday's lesson is about Paul and the unknown God. Paul shows us how to find common points 
when we are evangelizing to those who are non-Christians. We're going to focus on Acts 17, verses 22 and 23. Just as, men as mentioned before by Sister Jackson and Brother Jilks, Paul came to Athens. He toured the city. He got to know how beautiful a city, because it was a center of art, beauty, culture, knowledge, and philosophy. Mm -hmm. He also realized that this, at this time, the people in Athens worshiped almost over 30,000 gods. Everywhere you went, there was an altar or a statue. Someone was worshiped and there was some type of uh, presentation that was put in place for whoever, whichever God they worship. Yes, as was mentioned before, Paul was perplexed by this and he was kind of annoyed. He's provoked. But at the same time, he realized that these people had a capacity, capacity for worshiping a God. They knew that there was something beyond man. And this is what they were seeking for. Paul realized he had to change his method of, of sharing this knowledge that he had. Yes, with the Jews and those Gentiles who were God-fearing, he can go to the synagogue, but he found it very effective to, to go to the marketplace, interact with the people, start conversations with them, listen to what they have to say so he can begin to interject some of that good news to them. Amen. He also realized that there were two great philosophies that were very strong in Athens at this time. One was that of the Epicureans. Right. And the Epicureans were atheists. Um, they <sighs> deny the existence of God. That was their position. That was their philosophy. The other strong philosophy at that time was the Stoics. They are pantheists, meaning that God is in everything, nature, material things, their surrounding. They have an apathy toward life. You just kind of live and grin and bear it. So Paul realized how important it was to understand the people that he was now ready to give, to share that good news with. And so if you could put up that slide for me. Paul starts with four specific points. And after these points, I'm even gonna add a little bit more based on this study. The first point, when he realized how religious these people were and their desire to worship, he used that to praise them saying that they were religious and interested in spiritual things. And he praised them because they were worshipers. What he did, he was building a genuine relationship with these people by listening to their story, understanding pers their perspectives and building trust. He accepts them where they are. And that's what we have to do when we want to share that message. We have to accept people where they are. The second point, he showed respect toward them. And that respect means that he acknowledged and respected their beliefs and values. And he avoided being judgmental and dismissive of their views, aside from complimenting their desire to worship. He did not criticize their false gods or their false religion. Mm -hmm. Paul showed that he was familiar with their history, their culture, their art, their literature and religion. And by doing that and showing respect, that was also another commonality that he could use to begin to share the doctrine or his message with them. Let's look at the third point. As he was going through the city and getting to know what was there in Athens, he found an altar that was titled the unknown God, a bridge that united both thoughts. Here we have people who are searching for that God. 
They don't know who the true God is, but they know that there's something better than themselves and they haven't found it yet. And he used that as a bridge to bring them to the true God. Amen. He introduced God that they did not know, but they realized that there was somebody bigger than themselves. And that was another commonality that he used to introduce them to the true God. Let's look at the fourth point. He admired their desire to worship even that which was unknown to them. Okay. The God they seek was not made by man. That was in his message to them. He made it clear to them as he's beginning to share that commonality that the creator, the true God is the creator of all things. And this God is greater than man. He's the originator of man. Because in paganism and in idolatry, man has to bring gifts to their God to please them. Now, what is the difference with the true God? The true God, we live and breathe and we move in that true God. And he has a gift. And that is the gift of salvation for us. So these are the four points that we can take for Paul in trying also to evangelize to those who are not Christians. And I'm just going to add and build on that. We can share our own powerful stories. Each of us have a testimony. Our experiences and our testimonies are often what we can share to bring glory to God and salvation to others. Listen actively. Give others an opportunity to express their thoughts and beliefs. And listen, the many questions that the people of Athens had for Paul, he was able to meet and match them logically, in reasoning, in philosophy. And in doing so, they were able, he was able to get them to, he was able to get them to connect and build that bridge for them. Use relatable language, avoid jargon and religious language that may be unfamiliar to non-Christians, maybe familiar to us, but unfamiliar to them. Use terms and expressions that are relatable and easy to understand. understand. Speak in a language that they can understand um, using their history, using their background, you, using who they are. Because again, we are always in a position to witness to others so, so that we can present relatable facts. Answer questions humbly. Remember, Paul did not crit critique and criticize their gods. He was prepared with his knowledge and his testimony to answer the questions that they needed to know. Remember, all we can do is plant that seed and the Holy Spirit will do the rest, will work on the hearts of those who hear. Let your actions be louder than words, the way you live, the way you show your love, the way you show your kindness, the way you show your compassion to others. This is what we can do. And this can be a powerful way to reflect the teachings of Christ. Amen. So I'm going to end by saying that remember that evan um, evangelism is a process. And our role is to plant seeds, even though we don't see results immediately. But we need to be patient. We need to show love. We need to be good listeners. And we be, need to be sensitive to others around us and the beliefs of others. Our experiences are a part of how God has shaped us to be witnesses for him. Lean into our background. Lean into our testimony and experiences so God can use them to bring glory and salvation to others. Let's look at Wednesday's lesson. This lesson has been very fascinating to me from the standpoint that uh, Paul is dealing with an audience that is not Jewish, 
And even as a Gentile audience, uh, it was a group of people who are uh, philosophers. So uh, as Brother Jill has already made mention, I just want to begin with the distinction between uh, philosophy and theology, because there's yes. two distinct fields of study, and uh, they do share some common ground. It's what Paul used in reaching those who had not been reached before. So let me make three quick points, and then I want to share the slide with us. First of all, when we look at uh, the basis and methodologies of these two, philosophy is understanding the basic aspects of reality and existence, uh, knowledge, values, reason, mind. In a word, it's all about the pursuit of wisdom, if you will. Theology, on the other hand, is specifically concerned with the study of the divine, the nature of God, and the divine relationship to the world. So we have here uh, two different types of basis and mythology. As, as far as the subject matter, as I said, philosophy deals with the nature of reality, the nature of knowledge, moral philosophy, philosophy of art and the like, whereas theology is centered around religious doctrines and sacred texts and the nature of the divine, okay? And I'm dealing with this as a very a large topic. In addition to Christian theology, there's is Islamic, there's Hindu. All of these theologies are not a philosophy type of approach. And then lastly, when we think about faith, philosophy can address questions related to religion and ethics. It doesn't necessarily rely on faith or for that matter, revelation. Philosophy often sees to provide rational justification and arguments for their positions, and beliefs are subject to scrutiny and logical examination. On the other hand, faith is a central component of theology, and theology is rooted in the religious beliefs as given by the Word of God, and also for other uh, religions, based on the uh, teachings that they bring. So when we're talking about trying to reach the unreached, we have to, uh, as we as discussed earlier, we have to find common ground. We have to find uh, new ways of preaching. We have to also have new ways of teaching. So now let's look at how did Paul go about adapting his speech? In Acts 17, 24, he says, the God, who made the world and everything in it, in it, is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples <clears throat> built by human hands. So those 30,000 idols or gods are all in contrast to this creator God. And notice that God, that notice that Paul was making his point around the creator. Now, that's an interesting point to begin with, and I thought about this a while. I don't know if it's fundamental to everyone, but it, it strikes me that we all are concerned about our origins. And whether we try to explain it through philosophy or whether we go to the word of God that tells us our origin, the creation was the common point that Paul used. And so he went about describing the God who created the world in Acts 17, beginning with verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hand. He goes on, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. You know those 30,000 gods that were being described? Those are capricious entities. And so when you have 30,000 of them, you don't have any of them in my mind. <laughs> uh, here he goes on to say, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed time and the boundaries of their dwelling. It's almost as Paul is addressing them in a philosophical mode of such, but they are able to hear it very clearly. 
as he goes on to further say, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Notice how Paul is taking their actions that really speak to this need to have some understanding of God. If you got 35 <sighs> of them, you got like everyone looking for a God in their own individual way. Contrast, if you will, how Paul makes his appeal to an unreached people versus how he went about making his appeal to the Jews in Antioch. He preaches to them all around the history of the Jews, all around the seed of David, so that they can connect with the fact that the Messiah, which was what was the focal point of the Jews, that they could be connected with Jesus Christ, who's raised from the dead. So we see that when we are trying to relate to others, we must find not only a uh, common ground, we must also be very intentional about how we speak and convey the ideas that we're trying to use. And to do that, I have to tell you, you got to get into the marketplace. Instead, I mean, yes. I'll, I'll tell you this. Yes. This is a quick side because my time is spent. And that is this. One of the things I always look at is what do people are interested in? A few right. years ago, my granddaughters are into the big Marvel uh, universe, right? And I noticed that the number one movie in the world was this movie by Marvel about the end game. More, there was no, no movie has been seen more on the face of the earth. Now, if you're going to witness to anyone, chances are you're going to find someone who has seen that movie. And if you know nothing about it, there is so much content in there that you can bring them to a knowledge of a God. Because the movie, in my estimate, because I've seen it, it's on TV as well. It's all trying to explain a capricious God when you have right. real thing to offer to people. But if we don't expose ourselves or go into the marketplace, we don't have any means to sometimes relate to where others are coming from. That's the God they know. That's right. So we have to get into the marketplace in order to present Christ. We have to meet them where they are. Exactly so. Exactly so. And you need to know what you believe so that you can relate to others as well. So uh, Dr. Carrington, how did they how did uh, how did Paul present Christ to these good folks in Athens? I, I just want to make a, a couple points, maybe two or three points. If I were to go back to um, myself talking to someone who does not believe what I believe, hmm. and if I were to use the creation story, um, for in six days, <laughs> the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, so if someone wants to know, for my friend, that I am not available, on the seventh day, uh, the jokes is the cause of the creation by God. And so I can be an example there. So in preaching the creation of the earth, we can now be examples um, with respect to what we do on a Sabbath. Yeah. But notice that... Um, that Paul was presenting the Christ that he knew. Yes. This was not someone, something or someone or a God that he did not know. And in verse 28, when he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And for we are also his offspring. Look at the unity, Dr. Robinson, that he brought there. He says we are all together because we are his offspring. Right. There is something that um, rather than emphasizing our differences. Yes. Rather than <laughs> emphasizing um, our distinction. It says, therefore, since we are the offsprings, of God, 
we are not to think of the divine nature as like gold or silver or even confessing to a human being, Elder Rodriguez. Uh, truly, these times of ignorance, God has overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. It's a wonderful um, way of us, and, and it, I think I have a slide there of us um, preaching to the honorary, the same to the honorary. Uh, okay, one second. There we go. But the new methods. Right below that is the new methods. Okay. What you're suggesting, new methods must be introduced. God's people must awake to the necessities of the time in which we are living. God has men whom he will call into his service. Women, men and women who will not carry forward the work in the lifeless way in which it has been carried forward in the past. Mm -hmm. Our large cities, the message is to go forth as a lamp that burned. God will raise up laborers for his work, for this work, and his angels will go before them. Let no one hinder these men of God's appointment. Forbid them not. God has given them their work. Let the message be given with so much power, much power. that the hearers shall be convinced. convinced. Better job. Dr. Jackson. Dr. Jackson, our challenge. Uh, we have these challenges. Uh, prayerfully ask God to specifically guide you in how best to witness to someone you know, or how best to witness to the unreached and explore social networks. As a possible area of Pegasus, as a possible um, uh, public place that you can present the gospel to non believers with the clarity and discretion of Paul. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we thank you for this, your Sabbath. We thank you for your study. We thank you for the reminder that oh, there are unreached persons who need to experience the saving grace of King Jesus. So today, oh great God, we ask of you divine strength, divine understanding, divine skills in communication so that we can listen to others. We can go into their places so that we can start from where they are to lift them into the saving grace of King Jesus. We also need, oh great God, for, for our individual, for us individually to increase our passion, our knowing you a little bit more, oh God, so that we can teach and tell of your love of true, oh, not only what the Bible says, but of what we've experienced of your greatness, your provision, your keep, your compassion. Continue to heal, oh great God. And even today, as we... Close this Sabbath school study. We linger a little to ask of you your special grace on our young people, our young people who have experienced a sudden loss in our church. May they understand that all things work together to work together for good to those who submit themselves to King Jesus. Jesus loves them. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your saving grace. May we expand that that. That, that experience for our, our individual selves and help others to know that you, God, are in control and you are you mm -hmm. want each of us to experience your love, your care, your compassion, and your saving grace. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us in this continuing study of God's mission, my mission. And at this time, we'd like to share with you our missions spot.
Thank you for joining us at Church at Study. Join us next week as we continue to discuss God's mission, my mission. Stay tuned for our next service.